Hi again, everyone. Vince Lau coming at you from uh, Western University Critical Care Program with Dr. Robert Arnfield with another point of care ultrasound hemodynamic series case. Case number eight will be a Holcomb case uh, looking for systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve and also intracavitary gradient uh, determination. So please check out the westernsono.ca website, uh, How To by Dr. Robert Arnfield on stroke volume determination uh, prior to delving into this hemodynamic series. So getting to the case of an 81-year-old gentleman with known hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with a previous EF of hyperdynamicism greater than 70%, presented with a lower GI bleed and shock with a hemoglobin that had drifted down from uh, hundreds to 63 and a lactate which was greater than 15. Patient was intubated secondary to decrease uh, level of consciousness and uh, IV fluids were uh, administered with two liters of Ringer's lactate and eventually six units of packed red blood cells. Patient had ongoing hypotension secondary to the shock uh, with systolic pressure of 80 on 40 and in the emergency department, a central line was started and epinephrine of 14 mics per min was uh, added onto the patient's care. Heart rate was still 70s and the patient for his hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was on a calcium channel blocker of deltaism to slow down his heart rate and uh, give him negative inotropy. While intubated, the patient had good SATs of 95% on minimal settings, 18, uh, 12 of uh, pressure control, 5 of PEEP, and 30%, and otherwise it was a febrile. So the focus questions asked to the ultrasonographer at the bedside for the ongoing shock was epinephrine, 14 mics per minute, the correct choice as a vasopressor. Uh, was the patient still hypovolemic? Uh, what was the volume assessment uh, required for this patient? And was there a cardiogenic component from the Holcomb that was uh, um, complicating matters. Uh, was there systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve? Uh, was there intracavitary gradient as well? And we wanted to uh, see what the IVC was doing. So looking at the images themselves, so we he see here again primarily dry lungs with an A-line pattern uh, sliding lung, otherwise no B-lines. And this is seen throughout the apices. Uh, the patient also does not have any pleural effusions to note, curtain sign, uh, no consolidation in the lower lobes uh, in either plaps or costal views, and this is repeated on the right as well. So we see here in these still images uh, before we play the clip that the patient has what looks like a thickened myocardium, uh, which is possibly asymmetric as the septal wall uh, uh, look, appears to be thick as well. Uh, the patient has a trace posterior pericardial effusion, and as we play, play the images, it looks like the LV function is otherwise normal at this time. Uh, the patient also, we're looking at specifically here at this valve uh, to see whether or not the patient has any systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve leaflet, which would mean that in systole, the patient would have uh, the mitral valve anterior leaflet go towards the LVOT and therefore obstruct it during uh, systole. In parasternal short axis view, we see that the patient has hyperdynamic LV function. We see here in subcostal view that the patient has uh, biventricular hyperdynamicism. So we throw color across the mitral valve and we see that there's a, a bit of MR here coming back uh, into the left atrium. And we throw some color across the tricuspid valve as well and we see some uh, mild uh, TR as well. Having a look at the IVC, there is distension of this IVC and uh, there are small microbubbles indicating recirculation and high right atrial pressures. And again, we see here that the IVC is distended at uh, 2.6 centimeters uh, with no respiratory variation. So getting to the apical views, we see here uh, a left ventricle, which seems to be still hyperdynamic. We have a fleeting apical four to five chamber view with a look at the aortic valve uh, and the LVOT right here. Unfortunately, we don't see the RV very well at all, but we saw it in subcostal view and uh, saw that it was hyperdynamic as well. And we throw color across and we see that there's a lot of aliasing within this ventricle, um, indicating high flows. Uh, we don't see any AI, no obvious MR in these views, although we saw them in other views. And we're going to do some LVOT calculations right here, but also some intracavitary uh, pulse wave Dopplers across to see if there's any uh, evidence of Holcomb. So just to be complete, an LVOT diameter of 2.12 centimeters to calculate cardiac output. So at the level of the LVOT right here, uh, right before the aortic valve, we get a VTI calculation of 23.7, which is greater than 18 to 20. And we uh, get a max gradient of 6.5 and a mean gradient of 3 millimeters of mercury across there. So we put this into our cardiac output calculation with uh, 23.7 centimeters VTI with an LVOT diameter of 2.12 and we get a stroke volume of 84 cc's per beat which is quite high and our cardiac output is calculated to be approximately uh, 5.9 liters with a heart rate of 70. So as we can see here we're doing a pulse wave Doppler and we can actually creep along 
the mid-cavitary segment with pulse wave dopplers along here to see whether or not the patient has a mid-cavitary gradient. And as we can see, a very typical dagger-shaped VTI, which is suggestive of a uh, intracavitary hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Again, here we can measure the area under the curve with our VTI of 21. And although the, the max gradient is only 6.4 and our mean gradient is only 1.27, you can imagine that if this patient had an underfilled left ventricle, that this uh, peak gradient and mean gradient would be actually uh, more significant. But the most important thing to note is this dagger-shaped envelope in keeping with uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Other things that could uh, exacerbate a mid-cavitary gradient is obviously things that would increase inotropy, uh, similar in this case that epinephrine would actually make this mid-cavitary lesion worse. The other thing too is after load reduction where there's a decreased pressure in the aorta and therefore uh, increased flow through the mid-cavitary into the LVOT and therefore into the aorta that uh, we would actually want to increase after load uh, to reduce this mid-cavitary gradient. So here are some classic examples of uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve leaflet in hypertrophic uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy. We see in a slow down clip here that the uh, anterior mitral valve leaflet is actually touching the symptom and therefore occluding the LVOT. And we see this here in another example as well where the anterior mitral valve leaflet is obstructing the LVOT and causing that gradient. So knowing what we know now, how can we optimize blood pressure? So we would probably want to get off the contractility and inotropic agent of uh, epinephrine at this time as it could possibly worsen hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Uh, but we would want to swap it out for an uh, afterload increasing agent or uh, in this case a vasopressor like norepinephrine or vasopressin. Uh, we know that the patient's IVC is plethoric and well distended, so preload uh, has been adequately achieved given the two liters of ringers and the four pack cells that were given previously. And we would want, not want to increase uh, chronotropy at this time and keep the patient in normal sinus rhythm as to not further exacerbate and allow for diastolic filling time of the LV so we don't make the intracavitary gradient worse. So our recommended actions at this time were to not give any further IV fluids given the plethoric IVC, uh, to DC epinephrine as the uh, lactogenesis could confound the picture, and also DCing the epinephrine would decrease inotropy and thereby lessen the intracavitary gradient and hokum uh, exacerbation. And we had asked to uh, increase afterload uh, by starting vasopressin and uh, norepinephrine. So in terms of case summary, this gentleman with previous Holcomb had his epi DC'd and started on levofed of 10 mics per minute and vaso of 2.4. Systolic blood pressure improved tremendously to 140 over 80 and heart rate stayed 70s. The lactate eventually did resolve with no further IV fluids, just changing vasopressors. And eventually the patient got uh, as well enough to actually be weaned off all vasopressors and uh, discharged to the ward. So a very good end to the case. So again, thank you very much for joining us for another hemodynamic series case. Uh, please check out westernsano.ca for any POCUS hemodynamics and stroke volume determination how-tos before delving into further cases. Thank you for joining us again, and we wish to see you in the future. Uh, have a nice day.